started, Rich? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everybody that's um, here joining us live and for anybody that is going to watch this later and kind of catch up with our conversation. Um, over the next hour, we're excited to host the second um, video hangout for our second week of Write Out, which is um, a partnership with the National Writing Project and the National Park Service. Uh, my name's Chris Constantine. I work with the National Park Service and I'm an education program manager for um, Region 1, North Atlantic and Appalachia. And I thought maybe we could go around the room real quick and have the Write Out planning team introduce themselves and then our guest presenter also. Sure. Thanks, Chris. I'm Rich Novak. I am uh, part of this Write Out planning team. I'm also a high school English teacher in Fairfield, Connecticut, and a doc student at Teachers College, Columbia. And um, we at Weir Farm, a national park, a national historic site, I'm sorry, uh, just finished up our big activities yesterday as part of the Write Out, so we're happy to be here. Maybe I'll go next. I, uh, my name is Kristen Lassard. I am a uh, National Park Service Ranger and Chief of Interpretation Education at Weir Farm National Historic Site in Connecticut. So I work with Rich um, and we did host uh, some write out activities this last week, which was really great. And I've been part of the write out planning committee for a couple of years and just really excited to make connections with more educators and all of you. So thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Bethany Silva. I'm research faculty at the University of New Hampshire and I'm the director of a community literacy center. I'm a teacher consultant from the Philadelphia Writing Project. Even though I'm in New Hampshire now, I will um, always hold Philly dear in my heart. And I've been on the Write Out team for a couple of years now too. And then Amy um, is our guest this evening. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Amy Azano. I am a, an associate professor at Virginia Tech. Um, I work in adolescent literacy, but my scholarship is mostly in rural education. And I proudly participated in the National Writing Project back in the day when I was a doc student at UVA um, and actually was the co-director for two years as part of my graduate assistantship. So this was such a great invitation and it brought back lots of great NWP <laughs> feelings. So um, thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have a conversation with you and amongst everybody that's here with us um, on the video chat too. So we're excited to dig in. I think before we kind of get a sense of who else is on the call today, um, I thought maybe I would just remind us what Write Out is so we can remember why we're here together. Um, so we um, together have designed um, the in the best way that we can, though it's also emergent depending on how participants take it, but we've designed um, uh, this two week series of events and activities where educators, National Park Service rangers, um, writing project TCs, teacher consultants, parents, writers, and youth are invited to engage with um, with us online and in their particular places um, around three areas. Um, the first is to explore national parks and other public places, including urban and rural settings. And like I said, whether that's on site, on site um, in your place or whether it's online, we're all kind of exploring together um, in this two week event. We're in our second week of write out. Um, and together as we explore, we're also creating uh, across various media, um, very, uh, using text, video, images to kind of document what it is that we're discovering in our places and share that with um, everybody that's joining us online. Um, and as we kind of connect online, whether it's these video chats or the Thursday um, Twitter chats or just as we go out throughout the week using the um, using the write out hashtag, we're able to connect with one another um, using place-based education and um, uh, critical cultural and environmental lenses to kind of take a deeper look at our place and understand its application um, across education, uh, the education ecosystem. So we're excited to be well into write out this year. This is week two. Um, and this evening we have um, a couple of really exciting um, folks here joining us on the Hangout to kind of share with us their thinking about about place and its application to education. So we're really excited that you all are here. 
Um, and so we did have um, a question to propose to all those that are joining us today um, so that you can share with us a little bit about um, what you have been um, kind of in, and how you've been engaging with right out and so rich posted the question in the chat there so we're curious to know um, what has you interested in right out and what's one story place or idea that you discovered during what week one of right out and um, do you want to do you want to start us off rich absolutely absolutely thank you uh so what brings me to to this right out is the Connecticut Writing Project. I forgot to mention that the the, the host Connecticut um, site, the Writing Project site that I'm working with, I'm working with Brian Crandall there. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to be invited by Brian to uh, apply for a grant to to be part of this, and we've been doing it now for three years at the um, Weir Farm. And we just this past week, we had yesterday, we had 22 uh, students and six educators up at Weir Farm National Historic Site learning about uh, the National Park, bridging that gap between national parks and the National Writing Project. Um, and we took it to a place uh, where we let the students yesterday really explore the park and think about um, the story of the place that we were at. We asked students, um, what would this place be like before humans were here? What would this place be like um, when humans were here? What will this place be like um, in the distant future? Um, you know, and so I, one of the students actually did some speculative drawings of uh, speculative fiction about, uh, what would he say, some, uh, what was something about a god monster or something like, you know? So um, it was really an exciting way to, to get students to connect to place and thinking about um, how place interacts with them and how they can put stories to it. So this one student was pretty creative and thinking about the, well, I, you know, I, I think he was a little sci-fi oriented. So it was cool to see that kind of just juxtaposition, the natural and the sci-fi there at the park. Um, but, you know, that's the story I like to share today because I think it's important too to get those student voices into this mix um, as, you know, ultimately those are the people we're hoping to inspire with this place-based education. Um, so that's where I was and am today, and I'm gonna pass it off to anyone else who wants to chime in about um, thinking about stories that brought you to this. You know, what are some story about place or discoveries that you've made in this past week? Um, who else would like to share? Um, well, I have an interesting story. I don't know if it's technically part of right out, but um, last week I took, uh, I, was a, I was a chaperone for a fine arts field trip uh, to New York City. So I was uh, in Manhattan with 70 um, students from this Southwest Virginia area. And, you know, each chaperone, we had a small group that we were responsible for. And it was just so cool being with kids from, you know, from my part of the world. And we were, we were in the middle of the city and we were walking through Central Park and all the kids noted, they're like, oh my gosh, trees. And they all like commented on, you know, this, this thing that became all, all of a sudden familiar to them. Um, and it kind of like, you know, it made me think about the article and about what you all were, you know, that this was coming up and just how cool it was that the kids were able to sort of make that connection with a place that was very foreign to them um, by something so natural. And I thought that was really cool. Um, hi, I'll introduce myself. My name is Rachel Keel. Um, and my Amy is actually my advisor. My I'm a doctoral student at Virginia Tech. Um, and Amy, I just I would have told you I was coming, but I didn't know until like a minute before. I was I just get, get the emails because I was a, a National Writing Project person also from kind of a long time ago um, in Northern Virginia, and um, and I've been kind of following your emails because they're about place based education and writing the connection there, and that's exactly where my um, dissertation lies. I'm looking at. Um, fiction writing that um, fourth graders did um, as a part of a grant that Dr. Zano um, is the co-PI for. So um, I've just been immersed in um, <laughs> these awesome stories of students in rural places. Um, and I'm kind of just examining them to figure out like what um, evidence of place shows up in them. And I, I, Rich, exactly what you said, um, it's like amazing and fascinating to see like they're in this like science fiction world 
yet um, they're saying um, like, oh, like some so-and-so hollered. <laughs> and like, you know, there's just things that come out that I can tell are just like an expression of their rural selves in, um, in the mountains that they live in, in the oceans and all the fishing they do. So it's, it's really cool. Um, but thank you for having me at this, at this meeting. <laughs> Thanks for joining us as a fellow doc student. I'm with you. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll, I'll share one connection that I've kind of gone down into a rabbit hole with, which is um, uh, on the Twitter chat last week, we were talking about um, there's a kind of a conversation thread around like the meaning behind street names and road names, which I think Bethany brought up. Um, and it led me down um, to, and, and got me curious about what are the origins of some of the um, street names in Philadelphia. And some of the major street names are trees. So I never, I wasn't really super, that one seemed obvious, right? But there's, um, I've learned a lot over the last week around um, some of the other um, major, major or not so major street names in Philadelphia. So I'll share some of those um, uh, in the chat or like via Twitter or something like that, share some of my discoveries. But that's been a fun little rabbit hole because I've um, crossed over those streets so many times. And um, many of them, many of the street names are connected to um, folks that have some history in Philadelphia that are definitely on that kind of untold and for me undiscovered stories um, in the city that I've lived in for quite a while. Hi all, I'll cut in if you can hear me. Um, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yeah, go right ahead. Awesome. Thank you. So this is Maggie Vetch calling in from the Niobrara National Scenic River, and I don't have video on my computer, so I'm on the phone. Um, but I am an intern here, and so I've been working with Susan Cook and Bobby Rashone and our interp staff, and they are who got me introduced to Writeout. Um, and really what's interesting to me uh, about Writeout is that it focuses on writing, but it's in no way limited to writing. Um, so it's it spans beyond it into the sphere of creating and then connecting your creations to the place as a large contributor of inspiration. Um, and so watching all of the posts, I've been running our social media, and so watching all of the posts come through, hashtag write out, um, and seeing the artwork of kids creating a map of their place and saying, I just think it's fascinating that a kid can draw a map and you'll see that this tree down the street is a big landmark to them. Um, but to anyone else, they would go, it's tree. Um, but that's such a big part of their place um, and what they notice about what's around them. And so it's been really great to see um, all the creating that's going on and especially then the writing and getting to dig into that more. So thanks for putting this on. Is there anybody else that wants to share? Go for it, Kristen. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you brought up the naming that came up in our teacher workshop this week, too, in some of our conversations we were having about um, as we were planning for the students to visit, planning what the prompts could be. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we talked about also related to how, um, you know, how as we're even like as kids, we grow up like learning through stories. And so this like theme of stories kind of emerged through our work this week, too. So, you know, having the students right based on some prompts um you know like telling their story or the story of the place so it was like place focused but they also were prompted to either like create a work of art take a photo write a poem and so we had some really great conversations with a few folks too that stopped by our write out tent on the national day on writing um, about like all the different ways that stories kind of like shape our lives and our learning. Um, and I just thought that that was like a, a really cool connection to the theme of Write Out that we didn't even purposefully do. It just kind of came up. Um, and I thought that that was a really, really neat. And then the naming of, the, of, of places and like who can name a place. And a lot of our conversations that we had prompted these like essential questions that I want to now uh, put into our interpretation and our education programs. So, you know, we do audience centered uh, experience interpretation at Weir Farm National Historic Site. And so I'm always looking for really good essential questions. And I think working with the educators and thinking about it um, through the lens of write out, like prompted some really insightful, thoughtful questions um, that I'm going to continue to to use in our like regular programming, which I think was really cool. So. 
Lynn, I'm going to jump over to you. Do you have anything you'd like to uh, just share from your your encounters at Weir Farm? Lynn has been with us two years now. She came back twice, um, and it's really I think it's really fascinating and a, and a testament to the the kind of work that we're trying to do. At we're at right out, um, uh, but I'd be curious to hear Lynn what uh, what you're thinking about uh, this past week and our our workshop this past week or place or right out. Well, I was thinking. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, well, I was thinking about your original question. And um, so I took, I teach sixth grade language arts and social studies. And um, on Wednesday of last week, I took both of my classes. I have two different groups of sixth graders. Um, I took both of them out. And we just went into the edge of the woods. I had a prompt for them. We've been working on sensory language in ELA. And um, so we use that to guide the prompt. Um, but what I was, one of my takeaways from that experience, well, I had a couple, but um, even though, I mean, we live in Vermont, we're, we're all like sort of, doesn't take more than a couple of steps to be in the woods, in the forest um, where we live. Um, but the kids really responded to this experience as almost like a new experience, like this idea of being in the woods and writing and that and it kind of created this really mindful moment that we all shared together. And I guess that was my biggest insight was how, how this sort of created this really inclusive moment where everybody was um, thinking about what they were sensing, um, their sort of take on that moment. And especially when we got to sharing out back in the classroom about everybody's sort of perception on it, but nobody had, there was no hierarchy to who had sort of the corner on it, you know, or the, or the angle on it. They, you know, they all had their unique experience, but then we all shared it as this mindful moment together. And so I, it, it just, I'm always looking for, or I'm really intrigued with ways that get us away from just having the right answer and the kids that respond with the right answer. And then they kind of get viewed as the smart kids. And then the other kids go, Ooh, well, I'm not sure. And they don't want to take the risk of being wrong and things like that. And this was just one of those experiences that like leveled the playing field. Everybody was kind of in an equal space and, and it just was a really neat sort of organic moment. And um, that was sort of my takeaway from that experience last week. That's great. There thank we have you. it. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Great. Um, I think we do now uh, want to kind of turn over to Amy um, and talk a little bit about the article that she's written and um, I've read and I've, I've really enjoyed. Um, and, you know, I think the way we want to start this off, Amy, is to kind of just let you explain to us a little bit um, about, you know, what prompts you to write this article? Where, where does this come from? Um, you know, where, where does your love of place come from and how does it lead to an article like this? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for the question. Um, I, I love when I saw the invitation that the park service was part of this. That's, that's really new to me. I, I don't know that relationship with the writing project, but growing up in the Shenandoah Valley, the, the last part of your question, Rich, about um, why place is important. Um, you know, I grew up in a place where we were surrounded, you know, by the Park Service, and um, that's just a really big part of, of growing up in, in Luray and going up on the Skyline Drive and, like, all of these places that are just um, really important to the people who live there. Um, and, and it sort of, like, drives home the point um, about why I wrote the article. But, you know, in, even though I was surrounded in a valley by all of these mountains, they never came into my uh, education in school. So there was a there was an education that took place in my community that drew us to the mountains. And yet in school, I didn't learn anything about, you know, the history of the Park Service or that people had been displaced um, when the Park Service came there, including my own family. You know, so you, there was talk of that, but it was never in a way that where I could make sense of it, where I could develop a critical literacy uh, skill set to, to speak articulately about the place where I was raised. And so, you know, I talk about in the article sort of that idea of a, of a dichotomy, and that's what happened. It was sort of like um, my schooling in my community was one, was one type of education, and that was completely separate from the, the education that I got at school. And so one was considered, 
I think, you know, at least in formal schooling, more valuable. But where I come from is extremely valuable. Um, so, so anyway, to when this when I saw the call for the the column on critical uh, global literacies, and you know, I'm obviously really familiar with Dr. Yoon's work. Um, I thought, you know, gosh, do people ever write about that idea of local communities and local context being a part of this global context? Um, or do they see it as separate? You know, we develop global literacies and then we can also use place-based literacies or place-based education. Um, and is there a way to think about them as being, you know, part of the same? So I just wanted to, you know, offer a voice in that, that we can, that we can use sort of local context to, to make maybe the curriculum a little bit more relevant, but then also to see that, that we're not separate. You know, our, our park service, our local communities, um, those places are part of a global, a global uh, economy, a global community, um, and we can do both simultaneously. One doesn't have to be at the expense of another. Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's interesting to see how, you know, your article right here as part of the write out has inspired not just English educators, you know, um, as I was reading the comments on um, the annotated uh, marginal syllabus uh, document that from, um, Hypo, uh, help me with that, hypothesis? How do, how do you say that? Uh, hypothesis, right? The hypothesis um, organization. Um, you know, we were, it was a really interesting conversation between not just English um, education folks, but also um, national parks folks. And I, I really appreciate that it was um, inspiring to the national park uh, affiliates. But in the field of English education, you know, you mentioned how you weren't exposed to place in schools. Um, so as I'm thinking about you writing this, I'm wondering, you know, what did you want to see to the, say to the field of English education with this article? What, you know, what were your goals when you were writing that, you know, and, and putting it in English journal and, and really getting it out there? What did you hope to achieve in putting it in our field in that way? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, being invited to this type of space far exceeds any <laughs> um, goal that I had. I mean, this, you know, just to, to get this kind of um, audience for the work, I'm, I'm really grateful for it. You know, I think it was, um, well, I'll, I'll preface it by saying that I think I've written about in other journals um, about sort of arguing for rural literacies in general to be part of literacy conversations. Um, you know, I think often when we talk about diversity and we talk about you know, global competencies and all of those things, I, I think we sometimes forget that there are lots and lots and lots of rural communities and small towns across the country. Um, and they really, we don't, we wanna make sure that, that there are people sort of advocating for what, what diversity or what even um, marginalized spaces might look like for rural learners. And so part of it sort of goes on to, you know, that, that endeavor that I've been doing with a lot of my work, sort of advocating for rural spaces in general. Um, but specifically in the English Journal, you know, I think that, you know, I taught world literature for a long time and I, I taught the books that, um, that I reference in the, in the article. And, you know, they seem like if you're, if you're reading a book about Africa, you might not make that connection um, for students. You might not help forge that connection for students, but there's a way of making this place that seems really distant and far away, actually really immediate and really relevant. Um, so I think that was my, my big message, you know, for, for teachers, if I have one, um, all of the examples that you all have already given are way better than my ideas. <laughs> and I think teachers who are on the ground doing it every day are doing it way better than anything I could come up with. But, um, but I do just think that, you know, there's, there's a way to sort of honor in a firm place while also at the same time using it um, to challenge students, to make them think about you know, what's unique about my place? What is the connection I have with my place? And is that anything like a Conquo has, you know, a connection with his place? Or is that something like um, pl places that seem really far away? Could they use that to kind of make it seem more important, more immediate, more relevant? So it's not just English class being this place where we read books that have nothing to do with my life, but actually these books are really important. And hey, that's something that we do in our community too. Um, so that was probably one of my goals in writing it. 
Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to turn the questions over to everybody else in a couple minutes. Um, but I, you know, I really want to drill down on that idea of, you know, you're talking about how we bring those global places to our local classrooms, right? You know, as a high school English teacher, I, you know, I totally understand that, right? It's so hard to get students to really feel what it's like to be in a place when you've never been there. But once you go there, yes, you see it, you know, it makes sense. But as an English teacher, you know, with, with 15 year olds in front of us, for example, you're trying to figure out how can I get you there? How can I get you to do that? And I, I like the way you also position global right alongside the local, right? Um, can you, and you've talked now a little bit about that global side of it, but can you talk about how that, that relationship between global and local, like specifically the local, how do, how do you see those two talking to each other in classrooms and in also in theory? Well, I think it's tough, honestly. You know, um, Rachel mentioned that we we've had a grant, we've had a, a Department of Education grant where we're trying to um, create more opportunities for enrichment for gifted students in high poverty rural areas. And we've we've written a curriculum, a place based uh, curriculum for language arts. And when I talk to teachers about that, often it's seen as like one more thing they have to do. Like, oh, now you want us to talk about plays? Um, and, and these are people who are sort of already on board and, and, and wanting to reach uh, their students and wanting to meet their needs. But at the same time, because the curriculum is so decontextualized, right? We're in this common core and standards era, all of those things, and, and the pressure is real on teachers. And so when you're inviting them to use plays, to use the local, rather than seeing it as sort of like a natural in, I think a lot of times it's it's viewed as, as extra. They have to do it in addition to. And, you know, unfortunately the example I give around here, you know, we're in Southwest Virginia and there's a, you know, one of the oldest rivers in the world, the New River runs through the, the valley here. And, um, you know, the, the kids, it's not part of the curriculum. And so when my, my own children were little and they were learning about the Nile and they were telling me all these things about this historic river. And then I would say, you know, do you know another river that's, that's maybe even older? <laughs> and, they, and they really didn't know it. And it was something that they saw every day. Um, so it's just, you know, I think that maybe they're not speaking together, speaking to each other um, in really uh, sort of natural ways yet. But I think that was part of why I wanted to, to write, write the article, that there are, a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities to do that. And I think that, Lynn, when you were talking about going outside, um, I think a lot of times when people think about place-based activities, it's, it's sort of, it becomes synonymous with um, outdoor education or, you know, environmental, ecological, those types of, um, uh, that, that type of like motivation. But there's a way to still use place and to use local context, even if you can't get your kids outside. Um, and that's just sort of inviting them to question about what is it about our local context that might influence the way we see the world. And I think that that's where it goes from being place-based into critical place pedagogies. Um, and that's something I'm particularly interested in. And I think that's where, especially teachers in the humanities would find more and more you know, really organic opportunities to do that in the classroom. Yeah, and, and before we get totally critical, it also sounds like I'm hearing like, let's celebrate local place a little bit more. Let's let's bring that to the classroom. Am I right? Am I am I right there? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, back to my own, you know, my personal education, it's that idea that when we don't do at least some of that, then then the education that happens in these informal spaces, you know, community-based literacies, rural literacies, these things that that kids learn, you know, outside of school, if we never bring them into school, then we've created something that doesn't have to seem, you know, dichotomous in any way, but we force that on it. You know, so I think it's it's partly honoring and, you know, affirming that local um, but it's also like, why not bring the mountains inside? Why not bring your local river inside? Why not have that be part of the curriculum? And then, you know, next time they're in the car driving around, they'll be like, oh, did you know that river right there? Blah, blah, blah. And then they can, you know, use that as a scaffold to maybe understand places that are far more distant. So there's that celebration piece. There's that contextualizing, recontextualizing. I know Gruenwald talks about re-inhabitation, right? You know, you, you mentioned Gruenwald, great piece to read. Um, but you also mentioned those tensions, right? Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read a piece, you know, and I just wanna ask you, why do these, you put the tensions with place come when it is used only to affirm a student's sense of place 
rather to examine it critically. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about those tensions and, and what those look like um, in classrooms, what those look like in discussions with um, grad students, what those look like in, in discussions with students in pre-K, uh, you know, K through 12? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think um, I have a hard time speaking to that, actually. Uh, I'll, I can give you a for instance, because I think the example might uh, serve the purpose. Um, when I first started doing this work, you know, with critical place pedagogies or, you know, uh, place-based education and language arts, I was observing in a classroom where a teacher uh, was working and he had grown up in that same community. And so what I, what I found without a critical lens was that there was a lot of affirming, like where, where we're from is great, um, but they were also reascribing a lot of cultural values without questioning what those values are and where they come from. And, you know, in, in, a, in our current climate um, where, there, where there might be a lot of nationalism, you know, in school or conservatism or liberalism or any other sort of ism that might be going on in a community without question, I think that can be a very, um, that can be a, be a very powerful influence if that's coming from a teacher. Um, we're saying we're, we're going to do these activities and we're going to, you know, you know, rah, 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 you know, where we're from without any critique. I just think that becomes, um, you know, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that in any other part of the language arts curriculum. So we probably shouldn't do that just with place as well. And it might sound like I'm sidestepping a lot of ways of answering that question. And that's because I am. <laughs> so, um, but I'm happy to answer follow-up questions if, if you have them. No, you know, and you wrote about this in the possibilities of place, right? I did. I did, Rich. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to link that here um, and, and, nice. and yeah. let people see that because I, I remember that piece too. And, I, you know, that was really inspirational to my work. Um, but I, I love that you you go there. I mean, like, I know it's hard that you to, to talk about these things. And I personally, you know, have, have, in my classrooms, I've, I've had those tensions too. And it is hard to talk about it. But at the same time, you know, I think it's worth crediting you because you, you are there um, and you are talking about it. Um, but I do want to let other people kind of chime in and see if there's other thoughts that folks want to add to this conversation or or take it someplace else. Uh, so um, I'll jump in and say, like, thanks for it's actually um, really enlightening background to hear where this work comes from and kind of where you've been or along your kind of thinking in this area, Amy, and then others that shared also. Um, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me because I think that we're, um, at least those that are in park service that are kind of um, focused on education or um, kind of more broadly general visitor experience, uh, we're living in these parallel worlds. And it's really fascinating because um, we, I think all have, um, through our own paths, found a connection and, and really value the importance of place. Um, but, and we might be doing that for different audiences. And, and one thing that really made me think about that in the article was, um, where it was like the second page and, um, you said to use place critically is to consider how social constructs of place and gender ways of thinking or particular viewpoints from which we approach our world. And in, and in doing so, we learn to name the world around us and our relationship in it and to it. And when I read that, I was like, that... I totally identify with that. I mean, I, and I think that many folks in the National Park Service do because we care about that place so much and it almost becomes a blinder for, for us. Like it's our blind spot. We care about it so much that we forget that other um, folks in their education, whether that's formal or informal, don't necessarily um, have the experience or the training or what have you to look through a particular like a place lens and uh, whether that's science or, or whatever, um, uh, cultural history, whatever it might be. And, and, um, that really was a good reminder that, um, is uh, passion isn't enough and we need to meet people where they are. And so that I, I really appreciated that. And, and I have a couple other comments. I'm loving this conversation, but I'll see what other folks have to say too. Um, I, w I wanted to say I, I 
liked how Amy um, like brought it all back to literature, of course, um, as writing teachers, we love that. But um, I was, I read, she mentions the book thief in here and I read the book thief, um, I think last year while I was kind of immersed within the, in the play space pedagogy. And it is just um, what, what Amy was just saying about how if you over, um, over affirm um, certain places, it can lead to like a really bad situation because um, Liesl, the girl in the, in the book thief, um, you know, her home is being taken over by the, by the Nazis, by the Germans. And it's like confusing to her and some of the other characters in the book because, you know, clearly they don't want to join that side, but yet, um, this is their home and like what messages they're sending about like Germany is the best and we're, we can only have these certain people. So I feel like if you start with, um, you know, like a grounding in um, understanding our place and where we're from, it can just help us understand like how weird that would be if like all of a sudden like these bad things were infiltrating your place or if, um, you know, you're, you might be hearing messages about, like Amy was saying, um, in, I have read that other article <laughs> very thoroughly um, about uh, examining that one teacher and um, his relationship to place and just kind of like, I mean, that was so great that they celebrated their home and all the great things about it, but you just have to like look at both sides and kind of, um, it's like I'm just rambling a little bit, but I, I really liked um, talking about Copper Sun where they're being pulled away from their place and night where they're being pulled away from their home and just how it would mean a lot more if you like fully understand your own relationship with your place and then like now how would it feel um, to be ripped away or just to um, to just look at the good and the bad and um, you know just have that reference point at all times. And I'll just say, um, thanks Rachel. I, um, I'll just say too that, uh, you know, the, the example that I gave of teachers who might sort of, whether it's intentional or unintentionally reinscribe some cultural values. You know, what I have found is that when, um, when, when, the, when the teachers w was replaced by literature, you know, when the, when the curriculum became the thing that students were interacting with, um, and they were able to make sense of their own experience with place, that's where everything sort of started picking up. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is why it works. Um, and so I, I sort of wrote about this, this one teacher sort of acting almost like a place metaphor, you know, and I, I think, I think what's important in all of that is that, and I've written about that, this also in various places is that even within a same community, um, you know, we all have very different experiences and connections to place, you know, even if you're from the same place. And I think that's also something that we can talk about, you know, with young people that, you know, and that's where the critique comes in. And that's where to answer Rich's question. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the tension and, and that's okay. You know, like it's okay. Cause I think a lot of people in the um, annotations were saying, and, and maybe even Rich, we can talk about this more too. Like, gosh, how do you do that? You know, it's one thing to affirm just to say like, oh, you know, this is where I'm from and there's value in being from this place. And I think that's important. But then there is a tension when we start asking questions because then kids might go home and say, you know, to somebody that they're living with, like, gosh, you know, in class today, we kind of like disrupted this idea of whatever it is. And, you know, around here, it's the Confederate flag. I mean, that's something that students are interfacing with on a regular basis. So you can imagine if a teacher wanted to talk about symbols and that symbol came up, and you want to talk about tension, about place, well, that would be an opportunity, right, to ask questions about, you know, using Grunewald's words, you know, like, how have places been injured, and how do symbols represent that type of injury, and that's a question that you could ask young people, and I just think they're, I just think they're smart enough to handle it, you know, and, um, but I, but I do think that, they, but that we have to know it coming in and, and that, you know, that teacher that I talk about, um, I don't want to throw him under the bus because he, he wasn't, he didn't know that he was signing up for some big critical engagement. He was just using country song lyrics to talk about Hamlet, you know, so like, but, you know, I think if we have that frame and we have more of this type of work, you know, um, and, and also maybe even with pre-service English teachers and history teachers so that they have those questions that, they, that are teed up for them so that they can engage with that tension. Um, then we would get to that, some of that, you know, 
problem posing that Freire talked about, you know, and resisting the other types of, um, of ways that kids get taught in school. You know, and just to jump in on that, um, you know, I think that in my experience, you know, I have, I have, I have stuck my finger in that, that, that outlet, <laughs> right? You know, it's happened. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm constantly wondering about it is like, can you do the work without getting the shock? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's where we are, but it's always where we are and places are always critical. Um, and even something more benign. And I think the way, you know, Rachel, I'm glad you brought up the mention of the book, uh, the book thief, because, you know, what's really interesting about the book thief is the place is beyond just, you know, Germany, it's also that house. And, you know, one of the prompts I give students, um, in fact, I did it this year to start the year is like, um, tell a story about a place or what place is special to you. And yes, students often write about things like, um, you know, a river or, you know, woods or, or they'll write about like a place they go on vacation, but they'll also write things like, I had a student last year who wrote about their car. You know, like a car is a place too. And at the same time, we share these cultural values around cars, you know, and thinking about climate change and what's happening with cars, there's also a critical element about cars, right? So on the one hand, you know, we love our car shows and, and every, you know, I love, a, I love a beautiful Volkswagen Beetle, you know, my first car and I love my first car. But at the same time, there's something critical to it that's worth opening the door. And I think that, you know, just opening the door is a good thing. The question is, you know, what happens when Pandora is out of the box? And that's what sometimes when the tension comes. And I think, you know, we as educators are all grappling with that, you know, and, and especially in the English education field, as we get more into these critical works, you know, things like youth participatory action research, you know, I've done that in my classrooms and that's really hard. Um, you know, a lot of the research from youth participatory action research actually is outside programs. When you bring it to a public school, it's challenging. Um, but at the same time, to just pay it no mind just doesn't seem right either. So, you know, that's that's the tug, that's that tension, right? Um, one thing I wanted to add, um, what you were saying about how it, the place isn't just the town they live in, but it's their house. I know that was something I struggled with when I first met Amy and, you know, she would talk about place and she, but she grew up in like the most beautiful, idyllic, like gorgeous mountainsides. I mean, you drive through it and you just are like, oh my goodness, like the, the Blue Ridge Mountains on either side. And I grew up in kind of a pretty generic suburb in, in Minnesota and it's cold and I didn't like it, <laughs> um, how cold it was. And so I, I kind of had that, that struggle of like, well, like what was my connection to my place? And like, what, what do I talk about when I think about my home and my place? Do I talk about where I grew up or where I live now? And like, how long does it take to like really get that feeling? But I think th those are some things to explore with, um, with kids because they might not, um, they might not live in such a beautiful s space. Um, but what is it about their place that makes it theirs? Um, and I've been able to just kind of have that running question um, going through because, you know, even though I didn't love every single cold winter freezing day, um, I sure did love cross country skiing um, on certain days. And you know what I mean? Like, so there's just things, but, um, but it's not always about nature and scenery, but it's, but, you know, just kind of getting at, I think you guys could do that a lot with your, with the write out, like getting at what exactly is it that is, is special about your own place. So I'm glad you're doing that work. And, and it seems part of that to me is also identity, right? Like how do we explore taste, place and um, our own voice in order to kind of understand how our identity has been influenced and kind of what we want to choose for our identity, which is, um, you know, there's, it's definitely work that happens in the classroom and outside of the classroom too. Um, and it's certainly something that uh, that park service is involved with in the extent that um, we tell American stories and that we are each park is part of our national identity and there are individuals that are um, you know that have been in those places that make up that history that help to cultivate our understanding of our, our national story and our national identity um, 
but it's kind of all connected. So, and, and I actually hadn't, um, until you mentioned that, Rachel, I hadn't really thought about the connection to um, place, writing, critical thinking, and identity, and circling back to um, our national identity and the role that Park Service plays in that. So thanks for prompting that thought and that idea. So Chris, that actually makes me think of um, uh, Barbara Comer, who, this book is in my office just across the hall and I'll probably go run and get it in a minute. But, um, but one of the things I really liked about that book, she talks about uh, place and, uh, and, and like physical embodiment of a place in relationship to literacy. And um, she spends a lot of time talking about how place, place isn't just a thing like there's this socio-cultural aspect to it there's this aspect of places get created by the people who inhabit them which also Grunewald talks about too um but it's like without those relationships and without those things that we care about that place doesn't actually doesn't necessarily mean anything which I kind of apply to Amy's work as well because um you know that whole things don't mean anything before you've made that connection on the local level like you can't get there unless you um you know if if you're reading um if you're reading the book thief and you've never really loved a place or felt like a place was yours you might not be connecting like it's harder to connect with it on the same level Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a um, a great observation too because you know I've had students you know even grad students here at Virginia Tech tell me well you know my my place just isn't that special I just don't have that big of a connection or I've had lots of students say that they were in a military family and they moved around a lot so I I love the idea of the car rich like that that you can encourage students to think about you know it doesn't necessarily even have to be a place you know but you know like you said it's more about you know the ways that our identities are shaped and you know that lots of people when they talk about place identity they'll say you know um we're, we're connected to places because either it's afforded a certain behavior we're able to do something in that place um it might be because it's it's beautiful and um, i have to say rachel's right i mean it's the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Shenandoah Valley might just be the most beautiful place <laughs> um, that I've ever been. But um, but it also might be that place identity could come from um, something that's there that's cultural or religious. And that could be something. So you might have a place connection to a, um, a place identity that's been built to a place maybe you've never been to. But that's important to your your family or your culture and it might have it might have a, a religious artifact there or whatever um so i think it's really what we're kind of distilling this to is you know giving students the opportunity to think about how 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 those identities are informed and then how those identities inform our view of the world and that's where i was trying to make the um sort of that segue into these global competencies, that's kind of where I was, or not competencies, but this global literacies, critical global literacies. Um, and I do, I think there, there, has, there is some sort of inward looking before we're able to really understand the ways that we are affected by or affect our world. I just wanna give a shout out to uh, someone who just joined us here. Uh, Marvin, uh, you wanna just take a second to introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit of what we're talking about Amy's article. We're in the middle of a, a discussion about place. It's getting pretty deep. <laughs> it's really cool. But at the same time, you know, it would be great to just hear from you. You know, what brings you here? Um, no, I, um, yeah, I just saw this on Twitter. <laughs> so um, I haven't read the article yet, honestly. So I'm just checking in to see what you guys are talking about. I, uh, I'm a teacher. Um, I really can't say much more than that. Is there more that you want to know? <laughs> Not, not at all. Not at all. It's just uh, it's glad you're here. Um, we're, what we're talking about is um, like, how can we imagine place and in a way that's approachable for students? You know, we were talking about place in many different ways, like places like, um, you know, natural settings that people live in, hometowns, but then also cars and how cars um, are places that are useful for students. You know, I was thinking there's this article um, by James uh, uh, Callan, um, Teaching Hometown Literature, A Pedagogy of Place. And Amy, you were talking about military um, families who move around, right? And, th and that's, a, that's an obstacle to bringing place to classrooms, right? Especially, you know, we all have transient students coming in and out of our classrooms. So when we talk about place, often they're coming to a new place and that really is, talk about another tension 
that happens when a new student um, arrives in your classroom, you know, and then you're talking about local things and they have no idea what's going on. But at the same time, I like that idea of how we, and, and um, you know, Bethany, you were talking about this, like creating place um, is really important, right? Because, you know, and that idea of being in place, I think, I think that's Gruenwald as well too, right? Like that we need to really build in placement, right? Because placement is, is an embodied thing. It's, and it's, momentary it's also long term and we carry these places that we once were in we carry these places that we are in now we kind of think about those places we might go um but there's still a, a rich reservoir of resources to bring to classrooms because we're always in place but how in place into the you know social milieu of a place are we and that takes time um but i think when we do things like what we're doing at right out um, and, and Marvin, some of the things that we do at Write Out is we have students connect a place by, for example, mapping a place, drawing places, right? That's a lot like what we were talking, Kristen, about at our workshop at We're From National Historic Site. We were talking about how, who gets to name a place? And I think that if there's some opportunities for agency in our classroom, when we allow students to find creative ways to name places, you know, one of the things I do is take students to this little, you know, nook of woods next to my school it's like literally 10 acres and it's totally surrounded by suburbia and we go back there all the time and students never think about it in fact some of them actually get to school through this trail through this hike through these woods they never think about it but when we go spend time back there it actually like they they start building that connection to it and even though it's not the most glorious beautiful place like the the mountains in virginia amy um there is still opportunities to build emplacement um in our classrooms Yeah, I love that. You know, um, Paul Theobald in his book, Teaching the Commons, wrote about that, Rich. He wrote about intradependence. And again, that's sort of an invitation to students that, you know, we're here now. Um, so even if, even if there aren't these sort of historical, you know, transformative places that they've lived or been to, um, they're here now. And, you know, one participant I had in a research study said, you know, this is, all my kids are different, but this is the one thing they do have in common. And I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, the, some other examples of that for when kids are not from that particular place, or if you have a really diverse group, um, and the National Writing Project that published Place Conscious Writing, um, that's a really important book uh, by Robert Brooke who edited that. Um, and those teachers from the Nebraska Writing Project have lots of examples. And I remember, I might not be getting this quite right because it's been a couple of years since I read it, but. Um, but one of the teachers uh, the, from that project wrote about how she used these place conscious uh, practices to engage her English language learners who were new to this community. And they actually did projects where they were um, maybe like researching local landmarks and that sort of thing. And as a way to connect them, as a way to be like, now this is your community and let's learn more about it. So I think there are opportunities, you know, even if you're working with kids maybe who are not all from the same place. Yeah, and I just added in the chat there that um, the, um, Robert Brooks and the folks at the Nebraska Writing Project have been working with um, the Park Service um, site in Beatrice, and I think I'm saying it right, uh, which is Homestead National Monument. So it's been cool to see their, um, him as a leader and a thinker in place-based education kind of evolve as they're working with the Park Service site there. And not to say, um, I'm, I'm a little biased, but like, it, of course, this isn't work that only happens in national parks, you know, it happens in our schoolyards and um, in the community parks and, and students' backyards too. So, um, but it, I think that um, the, ex you kind of alluded to it earlier in the conversation, Amy, and then you also, um, uh, other folks brought it up too, but like what are, but there are many teachers doing this and are to kind of um, at least getting, hopefully not too close to the electrical socket, right? Like hopefully they're, the, they're, not, um, they're not having those kind of experiences that turn them off from uh, really trying this hard work. But um, I, one of the things that I've been really enjoying seeing on um, over these two, quarter, these two weeks of write out is some of those teacher examples, whether it's student work or teacher examples. And I'm infinitely curious about how we can support those teachers more to um, 
to, to make it to make play space and connecting themselves and their students to place not an add on but part of the work, whether that's through literacy or other disciplines. I think that, um, you know, I think the science disciplines are important, but I, I do think then we kind of default to um, more traditional play or more traditional um, environmental education, which has evolved and there's a lot more um, that other disciplines and pedagogies can add to that. So I'm really fascinated by that part of conversation in write out and then some of the articles that have been shared too, even on this, um, on this uh, video hangout. Do we have time for another question, Rich? Yeah, we're, 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 we're approaching the, uh, the eight o'clock milestone, but I'm just wondering if anybody, you know, here just from the write out experience um, has any connections to something that's happened or we've seen on Twitter um, over the past week. Looking at Robert, what's been going on in Nebraska too is fantastic. You know, one of the things they just posted recently, something suggesting that, you know, that idea of the everyday, right, is, is what place is about. We see the everyday and there's important literacy resources there. But I'm just wondering if anybody else has seen anything in the write out thread um, that might, you know, comment on some of the things that touch on places we've been talking about here tonight. I'm having to go back and look through the thread because I can't remember everything everybody's posted. I know, I'm looking, I'm looking for that Nebraska meme. It was a great yeah. meme, I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it, it's a great meme. I noticed a lot of people sharing like poetry. Um, so I thought that that was something I think a lot of people were drawn to was like, and also like writing and art, like text and art um, is, it just seems like that seems to come up frequently and it did last year too and right out in 2018. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing that that just naturally emerges through this work about place. Um, you know, that people are excited to share their stories and tell their stories in using more than just, you know, narrative writing, like you being more like using those creative outlets to tell a story. One of the things that has surprised me um, uh, is that uh, is how young a lot of these ways of writing go. Um, yesterday, while we were doing our writing party, we were tweeting out a prompt every seven minutes, and um, one um, one person who was taking part was uh, with her first grader um, writing from home. And uh, the prompt was draw a map of your neighborhood. Now add closer detail of a particular place. Describe a favorite memory from the place. And he made this map of my house, the playground, and the cornfield, like all the important places. And um, and then I also went on uh, my daughter's school does these family nature clubs, and they happened to be having an owl walk on Friday night. So with we had oh my gosh, there are so many people there. And I didn't post any pictures of it because um, like I encourage them to, um, I encourage them to, oh no, not that. I encourage them to uh, to take part in write up, but really it was, their, it was their thing. So we went on the owl walk and we stopped in the middle of the woods and we stopped and jotted and one-year-olds had clipboards and were like scribbling all over the page and um and you know all the way up through I think my son was the oldest and he was nine and like he was um he was drawing pictures of owls and I was just so amazed by this group of kids who were just like of course it's completely natural to sit down in the middle of the leaves and I was thinking about all the tick checks that went on that night but it was fabulous so those were two of my favorite things so far and those are great pictures, Bethany, too. I saw, I appreciate that. It was fantastic. Um, so yeah, I think we are at that, that time, right? And I do want to just take this moment to just thank Amy for uh, sharing with us this article and uh, inspiring us. You know, I think there's a really a great chat. Um, and we'll let that 
chat continue on the uh, the, the marginal syllabus document um, and and see where it goes. But Amy, thank you again. My pleasure, you all. It's been really great. Um, and I would just say, like, this will bother me if I don't say it, like, just about the tensions and everything. You know, as we invite young people and teachers to do that, I think it's just really important for us to, to know that, like, we can love places that have flaws, yeah. right? We can love places that are, that are confusing and um, that have lots of mixed messages and that are not perfect because there, there, there are no perfect places, there are no perfect people, and that's okay. We love them anyway. And so I think that that's, you know, as teachers grapple with that, just to remember, like, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not betraying anything to, to ask the hard questions. In fact, you're becoming a better citizen by doing that because you're more informed. And that's really what we want from young people. Um, so, but anyway, that would, that would just bug me if I didn't say that, but I just, I really appreciate um, that you all have, have read this. You've, you've really sharpened my own thinking on it. And I really appreciate the feedback. So thank you. Thanks for being here. And I, I think that's like the perfect note to end it on, really. <laughs> great, great. All right, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Places like family, right? There it is. Honestly. <laughs> yep. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And, uh, you know, we'll see you in the next chat, I guess, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you Thursday, 7 p.m. for a Twitter chat, if you can join us. That'd be great. Cool.